So this is part two with co coinciding with my near-death experience. So after my cousin woke me up and showed me those pictures and my ex-husband was there too, um, I found out that I had hemorrhaged and um, I ended up spending two more weeks in the hospital. Another one of my friends came to see me in the hospital who I had been staying with. And mind you, I was homeless at the time that this happened. Um, my husband was trying to work. It was just the worst experience um, for a pregnancy that you could be in. And I mean, every crazy thing you could imagine happened. A few times whenever I needed to go to the hospital, I couldn't even get there. And I got turned away by rude and asshole doctors who tried to say I was a non-compliant patient because of things like snowstorms and like that and being displaced and having to move from one end of the state to the middle of the state because my husband had gotten a job, even though I was a high risk pregnant woman. Um, and I had to move from that area to where the job was so that he could try to continue to make money so we could get a place before our child was born. And all of these other things were happening. And I also have two sons for those who aren't aware, some, background. I have two sons that have Duchenne muscular dystrophy from my first marriage, and both of them are fully wheelchair bound. My oldest son can only move three fingers on each of his hands. And, um, it's just another one of those things that played into all of this. And what we were trying to do was move to be closer to them to try to help be more part of their lives. And, um, still do what we needed to do for our own family. And there was dysfunction and abuse on, you know, their father's side, because at the time he was married to a woman who did not like me and she was trying to be a thorn in my side and my husband's and everyone's in our family. And it just, because she was so concerned and, uh, insecure and jealous and just full of piss and vinegar, basically. And she was even mean to my daughter during this time she actually beat my daughter and had the state called on her. And then I got called because my daughter was upset and she yelled at me while I was on my deathbed. So she was, I mean, every, people had told her, my nurse actually had to get on the phone and tell her, do not call my patient like this. Like you're risking her health. And that would, you know, that I could cite that as if something happens to her, that you are responsible for manslaughter. And I mean, that's how antagonistic and what a CU NT this woman was. So in any case, that occurred and um, there were just all kinds of crazy things happening and it ended up getting to where we finally just took our child and we went back to Alabama where we had, his dad had a house and we could just go and stay there without having to deal with all of this excess problems and the job didn't work out and things like that. But that's by the time we had moved back there, my son was only a couple of months old and I was really depressed. I missed my other sons. I, everything that I had been trying to do to be where I could co-parent with them as much as possible was totally ruined. They were doing everything they could to sabotage my parenting time with them. And my ex was even in contempt of court, which I could prove, but the County that he lives in is a, shit county in Tennessee that's corrupt as all get out. And I, I freaking hate that place. Um, but in any case, uh, they refused to follow that. And I was really depressed and my husband was barely making it. He went back into caretaking for his grandmother and he only made like $480 a month. I mean, it was really bad. And I was a blogger and a role player, like a text-based role player. And I wrote short stories for my own entertainment. And my mentor one day, he was like, why are you doing this? And he basically insinuated that I was wasting my time. That actually happened after my call to action, though, which is what I'm trying to get at. So let me back up a little bit. I'm getting ahead of myself. So when my son was about 11 months old, I was sitting there and my husband was at his grandmother's caretaking for her. And um, my baby was sleeping in his bouncing seat. And I was just sitting there kind of bored at this moment in the middle of the day. It was like 11 o'clock in the morning or something. And... Um, I'm just sitting there and it's all quiet and there's nothing on TV and we don't have any internet and I'm just really kind of bored and I had books and things to read and I'm sitting there, but 
all of a suddenly out of nowhere, like this voice comes into my head and I don't hear voices or anything like that. I don't have any of those kind of issues. Thank God. But, um, this was unlike, it wasn't just like my own voice in my head thoughts, you know, that we have, it was like a totally different, like the tone and everything. And I had never heard this voice, but it was like out of nowhere. I heard this voice and it was very calm, but authoritative and it was masculine. And it told me you are supposed to be the voice for those who have none. And I literally like, just like kind of went, what? Like closed my eyes like that and just kind of exhaled. And I'm like, what is going on here? Am I hearing crazy voices now? What in the heck? And again, it came, you're supposed to be the voice for those who have none. I have given you skills and talents. And if you use them, I'm going to elevate you to a place where you are going to be taken care of and your children will be taken care of and all the things that you're worrying about now will be taken care of. Everyone that you love will be taken care of. Everything will be taken care of and you will be able to do what you love to do, what you're talented at and what I gifted you to do as long as you use it to help the people that have no voice. And I thought, look, <laughs> I am poor as can be. We make $480 a month together. I live in the middle of a rural town where there's no work. I have this ability to write, but there's no internet. It's not like I can do anything to actually make any money online. And making on money online was a lot harder back then than it is now. Like the creator economy and gig economy has bumped so much from this time, but it wasn't like that then. Anyway, then I decided to go, you know, maybe I just need to go get some adult interaction or talk to a friend. And I took my baby and I walked over to my mentor's house. And I sat down and I had let him a few days before actually read a story I began working on, which funny enough is now on the market. It's called Embracing His Empire, if any of you want to read it. Um, really good story, I think, one of my best. But he told me, he said, you know, this is really an amazing story. Why are you doing this? And I was ready for him to chew me out, tell me, lecture me, whatever, about how I was wasting my time and I needed to be doing something to make money and help my family, which I didn't disagree with. I just didn't know how I was going to. Um, cause I used to be a Spanish translator, but then as I lost my hearing, I couldn't guarantee translations and I had had a plan to go get certified to do all these other things because I had translated in courthouses and for banking and financial institutions and doctor's offices in many places. And I loved to help people, but that wasn't going to work out. So I needed another plan and I had worked at gas stations and things like that too, but they just never cut it. They never do. Um, and so anyway, I go over and he starts telling me this and he, I said, you know, I, I don't even know where to get started. And, you know, I don't have any writing real experience other than just my own amateur here. And he's like, no, why don't you get on my computer here and you can go ahead and Google and check and see what you can find. And I told him, you know, I'm not going to find anything. It's just going to be AP writing or something for journalism. And that's not to my interest, which now it really is. But it, I was younger then. I wanted to do more fictions and stories and things like that. Um, but as I've grown and evolved, I found that that is something I'm interested in as well. In any case, I got on this computer and I found the college that I since have graduated from twice and I got my master's degree from. And um, from there, I had already independently published some of my own books and poetry. I learned to do that while I was still in college. And my first book was actually released July of 2013 that I did on my own. By December of 2016, I had signed with an imprint and my three books that are under that publisher, which are Simply Scarlet, The Softer Side of Texas, and Embracing His Empire, um, are all under that imprint. And I've also since done, like I have an anthology coming out. It's going to be pre-releasing on September 15th. Stick around because I'm going to talk a lot more about that. Probably be doing some Blitz promo about that very shortly. And I'm really excited about it because it's a paranormal fantasy collection that I'm involved with, with a lot of really awesome authors that I know that anybody who's into that kind of stuff will love. But, um, I have had a film pitched. I have fit, pitched to producers. I've talked to producers. I have producers I'm in connection with. I was invited to a film festival and I have a screenplay that's on a producer's desk. Of course, we all know the writer strike is going on, so that's all halted. And I've been doing mostly ghostwriting scripts for video games and things like that and managing my company since. But that's where God has taken to me too from listening to that advice and my mentor.